Okay, so they give the example here of, uh, say, if somebody uh, wanted to reveal to a partner or to someone in the medical profession uh, their health uh, situation, such as their HIV status, you know, they might want to reveal that to a sexual partner, to um, uh, their doctor, right? But they might not want to share it with their coworkers or maybe even their family members. So this is what they, um, this is the type of uh, nuanced complexity of, of identity and sharing of, of uh, say, sexual health information. Uh, and, and the authors um, sort of you know, discuss this within the notion of, they call it inte contextual integrity. Again, like I said earlier, the Thanksgiving dinner room table, what are you going to be choosing to share uh, versus, uh, you know, if you're at a Blue Jay game with friends or the pub or, uh, you know, a dance club or whatever it might be. Uh, the, the, the contextual uh, or the, uh, uh, a board meeting at, at, a, at an office, you know, your job or something. Uh, it, it, it's contextually uh, variant. And, and because the authors argued that this is how context, you know, works, that's why Facebook has so much trouble even, it, it's nowhere near being able to uh, be able to manage that type of uh, contextual uh, integrity. It just can't do it. Maybe in the future, but certainly not now. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, uh, now we're at the heading, the paradoxical nature of social media and algorithmic social sorting. So they're, they're, they're saying there's a clash here. There's a paradox. Okay. And what is the conflict? What is the um, paradox? That at the same time, a Facebook user is on there being able to like do maybe wonderful, really great things and form really great opportunities and bonds with people on Facebook. But on the other hand, at, well, not on the other hand, at, simultaneously, on the other hand, actually, is what the authors note, but, you know, simultaneously, they are, they are a product that they are helping to create. They're a product, their Facebook profile is helping to create the product of Facebook data that is being uh, categorized and scraped and monetized and sold. And they are sort of creating their own product that they don't, that they have no role in selling or benefiting from or monetizing from. The authors then continue to say the, you know, like the padlocks, those digital privacy controls that we see on platforms like Facebook, sort of, as the authors note, suggest that you have some kind of control or agency, right? But the authors argue the reality is that beneath that little digital padlock, there is a whole complex algorithm that just continues on operating in, regardless of your privacy settings. And that this can affect, you know, what you, you know, the outcomes of what you share on Facebook. And so it looks like the Swedish uh, study here also indicates with the uh, people with disabilities and diagnoses, impairments and diagnoses, uh, when they go on the internet, what device are they using? The, the majority, as was noted earlier, use a smartphone. So if that's the case, if people have impairments and diagnoses, if they're using a smartphone, how does that relate to their inclusion in the digital society? Okay, again, they're sort of summing up here. As you all know from this class, but that they explicitly state here, uh, page 116, quote, there is not one digital disability divide. Our results expose several digital divides facing people with disabilities. People with disabilities should not be regarded as one homogenous population, end of quote. So they're, they're restating what they said earlier after talking about their findings. 
Okay, and here they're summarizing. This is very helpful class on page 116. They're summarizing and discussing their findings. Okay, about devices. Quote, people in many disability groups report less access to devices compared to the general Swedish population. Okay, end of quote. Okay, in gender, in general, they find, quote, women with disabilities use the internet more and for more com complicated tasks than men with disabilities, end of quote. Okay, interesting. Uh, disability, the perceived inclusion, how do they feel about their inclusion? sort of mixed results here. Um, quote, in some of the disability groups, larger portions compared to the Swedish population uh, reported being excluded from the digital society, but in some disability groups, larger proportions compared to the Swedish population reported being included in the digital society, end of quote. So kind of, you know, a varied finding there, let's say. Um, Okay, and then this is an interesting finding. Uh, they're noting that, quote, many of the exposed disability digital divides indicate that people with disabilities are disadvantaged, but in the case of engagement in social media, the divide is reversed. This is very interesting. The clearest example is blogging, where uh, people with disabilities have a blog more than the Swedish population, end of quote. So this is an interesting example where digital inclusion is actually higher in the blogosphere. Uh, WordPress is an example of a blog. Maybe some of you uh, have visited or even kept a WordPress blog. This is a video I just watched recently from this year from Humber College where this is a screenshot from the video where they note that more than 70% of Humber students access their courses through a mobile device. And I knew that there were students who attended class through their phones, but I have to say I was really surprised that more than 70% of Humber College students attend class right now, you know, there's the pandemic going to class online, but but even just course materials in general, stu more than 70% use their phone to access those those courses and those course materials instead of a desktop computer like is pictured here. Maybe some of you still actually have a computer like that. I think I have one somewhere in a closet, but or or, or maybe you use a laptop right? But according to Humber, in this 2021 video, more than 70% of Humber students are using their mobile phone. So this is why Humber is updating Blackboard to a full Blackboard Collaborate Ultra uh, experience. The old Blackboard, according to Humber, was not designed to be accessed through mobile phones. Some of you have already probably noticed that. I noticed that this week when I was trying to do stuff on my phone and for for a Blackboard and it was quite a struggle. I got it done, but it wasn't ideal. So apparently the new Blackboard Ultra, the new Blackboard for everybody starting next term is going to be a new site that's works, that works better on um, mobile phones. It's also supposed to be more accessible for people with disabilities, so that's good too. So I want to do a little shout out there uh, to Humber and Humber students on mobile devices going to class. I'm, you might, some of you might be watching this video on your phone right now. So be advised, a new Blackboard is coming for next year. But this is also relevant to our in-class reading from Donner because Donner talks about increasingly, you know, and, and, and internet users in the global south formerly known as the third world, they're actually leaders in how to do all sorts of things on your mobile phone. Because as Donner talks about in, in his book, After Access, you know, 
in the third, formerly the third world, the global south. Um, I don't have the exact stat with me. I would if I was writing an essay. <laughs> it's in Donner's book. But the majority of Internet users in the Global South in 2015 when he published his book, or when was writing it at least, uh, the first computer somebody would have if they're in the Global South would be a mobile phone. That would be their very first computer that they own, you know, digital device. It wouldn't be a desktop computer. It wouldn't be a laptop. It would be a mobile device. So, and in part that was due to uh, a historic digital divide about broadband internet at home or at school. And that if you were going to get on the internet in countries like South Africa, India, elsewhere, it was going to be on a mobile device. So Donner's book is from 2015. We're now in 2021, almost two years into a pandemic for North America. It'll be interesting to see what sort of new research comes out of students using mobile phones to go to school during a pandemic. We've seen this graphic right here from Humber already. I look forward to you know, hearing more about this and hopefully maybe doing some, some research related to it. Chris Coburn is a communist. Hello, and thank you for your interest in Mint Mobile. Uh, many of you have asked why Mint isn't available in Canada. And that's a great question. And it's why we bought that billboard. Canadians, they, they pay some of the highest wireless costs anywhere. I kind of want to say call your representative. Is that too aggressive? I'm not saying call your representatives, but I'm also not not saying that. So, you know. I hope that Ryan Reynolds video was funny and informative. And keep an eye out for Mint Mobile. See if that actually goes anywhere.